Firstly, it is our desire to canvas as broad a spectrum of questions from as large a number of the members of the audience as possible. Each person is therefore restricted to one question. I know sometimes it is unavoidable preceding a question with an explanatory discussion. Where this is absolutely necessary, I request you to be extremely cursory or succinct. However, if at all possible, try and avoid, try and avoid preceding a question with a discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, you're now invited to walk up to the mic, which is a few meters away from ourselves. If at all possible, to name yourselves and to state your designation, as for example, Mr. John Doe, teacher. If you'd prefer to remain anonymous, that suits us. And from there, to put your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now walk up to the mic and ask questions through myself. To the mic near the pole, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we have gathered you today in the name of God and this gathering. It will make us understand what God is. For most of all, what I'd like to ask these people here, who are teaching us a very simple question that we may understand what God wants us to do. Okay? Could you can I speak to you? You asked me, how do we know what God wants us to do? Is that what the question was? That's it. By theology. The word theology means God's relation with man and the universe. Why did God create man and the universe? Where is the answer to this question? That's OK, you're finished. Then. That's okay. it. Theology is uh, an invented word, which just means the study of God. And it's not a science like biology is, so that you want to know something about biology, you go and get a book about biology, and you read, and you, you grant that what you read is true. Theology, anybody who wants to write about God can write about God. So you can't go and pick up a book about theology and say everything in it must be true. It's like biology. It's not a science like that. It's filled with everybody's opinion. So people's opinions have to be sorted out according to how much they're worth. Now, the human mind will reach to a certain point, get some points correct and some points false, but a careful man is supposed to be able to choose this is the true, this is the false. This makes sense, this is nonsense. Okay? So, for a start, you've got your own mind. What you can figure out for yourself and what you can judge from what other people have told you, you take input and so on, to come down to the final detail of it, you need a revelation from God because the human mind is different from anything else you find in creation. You find little insects, they need something to eat. Sure enough, there's something provided for them. Bigger animals, they need food. There's something else they eat. The plants have something they eat. Everything is provided all the way up the scale. You get to the human being, things are provided for him. There's a place to eat, a place to sleep, and so on. But he's got something nothing else has, a mind that asks questions. So it's only reasonable to believe that if something is provided for all of his other needs, he has a need to know something must be provided. He should look around somewhere. He should find the provision that answers his questions. And that is the nature of revelation. Now, of course, there's lots of books that say this is a revelation. They make that claim. But again, you have to judge the authority. This book says it's from God. Read on. Does it sound like God or not? OK? What's that now? We are not atheists. We are not atheists. Uh, God has given us a guidance. Yes, I agree. God Where's has given us a guidance. Where is the guidance, please? I just told you. You're going to find it in some book somewhere that says this is a revelation from God. Okay. Let's you, you figure it out as you go along which ones are worth the title, which ones deserve to be called a revelation, and which ones don't. That's up to you to figure it out in your head. 
Okay, Let's, let me ask you one more question. The book. Let Thank me see you. the Bible. Thank you, you Mr. Miller. Are there any other questions, ladies and gentlemen? Unfortunately, we don't have time to accommodate more than one question from one person. Are there any other questions, please? Will you please take your seat, sir? My question is very brief. I would like to ask Mr. Sida, from the Quran, from the Bible, I can give him at least 25 predictions made by different prophets over a long period, over 1,600 years apart. And they were all fulfilled in connection with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in three days, all those predictions. Is there any prediction made in the Quran which does not relate to the prophets of the Old Testament? Thank you, sir. Mr. Didat? Just to clarify the question, is there any prophecy of the Quran, you say, which does not relate to what? I, I lost you there, I'm sorry. Which is not taken from the Old Testament. Oh, is there any prophecy in the Quran that doesn't come from the Old Testament? That's not taken from the, yeah, from okay. the Old Testament. Yes, sure. Uh, if, it depends on what you mean by prophecy. If you're talking about a prediction of something to happen, yes. You have, for example, one of those falsifiable statements, as I said. I believe he was quoting it when he talked. The Quran says to the Muslims, you will always find that those closest in love to you will be the Christians rather than the Jews. You see, today, that still stands there. It stood for 14 centuries to the Jews, telling them, you Jews want to prove Muslims are wrong here. The Quran tells you what to do. It says, treat us better than the Christians do, and we'll believe you. You see, it's told the Jew, all you have to do is start treating Muslims very nice. Let a few years go by, then say to the Muslims, doesn't your book say the Christians are better friends than we are? Look, look, we're better friends. But they never thought of it. My That's a prophecy. My see. question was for Mr. Sadat to answer. Oh. <laughs> Your question has been framed in such a roundabout way. You said that it's a very simple question. But if you will put it simply to me, it will make it easy for me to answer. Will you please repeat your question? My question is, do you have any predictions in the Quran? Right. Any prophecy in the Quran? In the Quran, that yes. Was not yeah, taken there, are, there are prophecies in the Quran. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, when they were under trials and tribulations, when there seemed to be no hope, God Almighty gives the Holy Prophet Muhammad a hope that he is going to conquer. And they will be able to return to Makkah and perform their Hajj. Then there is a chapter in the Quran called Surah Rum. Rum. And in that Surah, the incident that is referred to is that the Persians and the Romans, they were at war. And the Persians conquered the Romans. And in the Quran, they were told that within a small period of time, the Romans will once more again conquer the Persians. These are prophecies being fulfilled in the lifetime of the prophet. And, and a standing prophecy about the supremacy of Islam over all the religions. You see, in the Holy Quran, we are told, it says, that the whole, God Almighty has given Muhammad, in Islam, a religion, a way of life that is going to conquer, supersede every way of life, whether it be Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism. And from the uh, figure that I gave you at the beginning of my talk, where I said that there are a thousand million Muslims in the world today, as against 1,200 million Christians, numerically people who fill census forms, 1,200 million. But if you take into account that Islam started 600 years after Christianity, you can see the obvious that Islam is superseding every other way of life. And in the Plain Truth magazine, 